Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. I'm your host, Nick Morris from the University of Maryland. And today, in preparation for World Coma Day, I have two very special guests. I'm excited to have us uh, join us on the podcast. Um, we have Brian Edlow. He's Brian's an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, the co-director of Mass General Neuroscience, associate director for the Center for Neurotechnology and Neurorecovery, and the director uh, for the Laboratory for Neuroimaging of Coma and Consciousness. He serves on the Curing Coma Campaign on the Scientific Advisory Council. And along with him, uh, very excited to have the co-chair of the Neurocoma Care Society Curing Coma Campaign, Dr. Claude Hemphill. Uh, Claude is professor of neurology at UCSF Whale Institute for Neurosciences and director of the neurocritical care at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, Brian, Claude, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Nick. Very Great excited to be here, Nick. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we are getting very excited. We are uh, just coming up on World Coma Day. And um, Claude, you've put a lot of work into this. Maybe you can start off by uh, talking to the listeners a little bit about World Coma Day and, and what it means to you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, we're now in the fifth year of the Curing Coma Campaign, and we set up the Curing Coma Campaign through the Neurocritical Care Society based on a strategic planning meeting we had in 2018 regarding neurocritical care research, really gaps in neurocritical care research, and what should we take on as a society as a shared mission. And we built the Curing Coma Campaign as this a notion of a blue ocean. Uh, a uh, blue ocean is a, is a marketing term that means uncontested market space. And we realized that we really were seeing these patients with disorders of consciousness and coma acutely in the ICU every day. And that was the most common unifying question that we would all be asked. Are they going to wake up? What can we do to help them wake up? What can we do to improve their chances of uh, good cognitive recovery. And so the Cure and Coma campaign was set up as a, as a platform to advance both the science and bring together the community to implement this. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the science today, but World Coma Day is really a highlight of our community and how we're coming together in a day that um, everybody can participate in. Uh, whether you are a cognitive neuroscientist or a nurse uh, at the bedside taking care of these patients or patient and, and family. And um, so World Coma Day this year, it's our fourth World Coma Day, and this year we're focusing on public outreach and uh, uh, stories of hope. And so um, we're going to be having a release of videos on, uh, on YouTube on that day, sort of like a uh, a Netflix type release. We're going to release a, a, a group of videos uh, across different aspects of, of coma and consciousness uh, uh, for a variety of, of audiences. But we're also uh, recognizing that we've been kind of serious about this, and that's good, but a lot of societies and a lot of disease interest groups have opportunities to come together with um, fun runs or shout outs or so forth. And so we're also emphasizing these things uh, this year. So I'm, I'm part of the running group for March Miles for, <laughs> uh, for World Coma Day. And that's part of the fundraising effort where we're raising money through the Neurocritical Care Foundation for uh, Cure and Coma Campaign Research. So um, I'm encouraging everybody to go to the website and register and be part of a team. Uh, let your groups uh, in on it and uh, uh, be part of World Coma Day, however you however you choose. That's that's great. Claude, can you talk a little bit how um, the Neurocritical Care Foundation falls into all of this? You mentioned we're, part of what we can do here is raise money for coma research. Um, how important is it to young investigators to get the kind of funds that might be available through the Neurocritical Care Foundation for early coma research? You know, I think it's a a great opportunity for us to to seed our work, especially for early stage uh, work that will allow us to develop preliminary data that can seek other larger extramural funding. An example is the ongoing COMPOSE study uh, that Dr. Chethan Rao at Baylor is running and many of us are participating in right now, which is a prospective observational study of, of coma incidence uh, and, and recovery uh, patient level data. Um, this is funded through the Incline Grant, 
uh, for example, through the Neurocritical Care Society. And so um, uh, raising money through the foundation is going to provide us the opportunity to not only fund existing programs, but, uh, but expand them. And I think that all of us are, are uh, working towards treatment in coma. And so I think that's one of the big focus, uh, uh, focuses now is to, to get us uh, preliminary data to push treatment. That's excellent. And Brian, um, I've had the pleasure of, I think, knowing you for a long time. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's thought so deeply uh, and so often about coma and coma recovery. Um, as as part of the Curing Coma campaign, I know there, there's some big initiatives here, and, and some of those are getting us to all start kind of talking the same language. And, and you've been part of that mission through the Coma Data Elements Group. Can you talk a little bit about what your work has been like with that group and, and what you've uh, worked on for the last year? Thank you, Nick. It's really an honor to get to participate in this NCS podcast with you and Claude. I also want to recognize Diwai Olson and other leaders of the Curing Coma campaign who are truly transforming uh, the landscape for, for coma care and for the future of this field. Uh, so I wanted to start with that message of gratitude. And as you point out, we are in a transitional moment now, this liminal space where exciting developments in advanced neurotechnologies like functional MRI or EEG that were previously only in the investigational domain are now transitioning to the clinical domain. We've seen that with the 2018 guidelines in the United States, the 2020 European guidelines, and people in our field are now confronting the possibility that this vast array of new tools that could improve diagnostic accuracy for detecting signs of consciousness and the accuracy of our predictions, our prognostication for long-term outcome, are going to be available to us soon. But we also face a situation in which if you look at the data, and I point here to uh, the Come Together study that was a Curing Coma campaign initiative led by Raymond Helbach and colleagues, if you look at these epidemiologic studies and survey-based studies at access to advanced neurotechnologies, what we consistently see is that around the world, <clears throat> it's only about five to 10% of clinicians who have access to these groundbreaking tools that are now endorsed by the US and the European guidelines. And so as the Curing Coma campaign has continued to find ways to move this field forward, one of the key initiatives has been, how do we find ways to all speak the same language, literally and, and figuratively, with respect to how we share data? How do we find ways to disseminate and democratize these technologies so that they're available to people all around the world, not just at a small number of academic centers? And the Common Data Elements Initiative that you referred to is, is a key piece of that puzzle. And just to provide a little bit of context here, this was an initiative that I had uh, the honor of leading along with Jan Klassen and Jose Suarez. There was a big team of collaborators, uh, multiple different work groups across domains like neuroimaging, electrophysiology, behavior, outcomes, family communication and goals of care. And that's just a small number of these work groups. Each of these groups were put together to create a list of data elements that should be involved, that should be used for studies in the future that focus on patients with coma and other disorders of consciousness. And the work groups met uh, either weekly or bi-weekly for several years to reach a consensus on which variables would be most relevant to studies that will push our field forward, which of these variables are uh, important enough to be used in studies, not just, again, in large academic centers, but also community centers and, and under-resourced areas around the world. We are very proud that those common data elements have been released to the public in a series of case report forms. Uh, there's a website on Zenodo, Z-E-N-O-D-O.org. And if you go to Zenodo.org and just put in the little search box, common data elements, disorders of consciousness, you'll see the list of case report forms. They're all freely available. The descriptions of how these CDEs and their associated case report forms were generated have been put forth in a series of papers published in uh, neurocritical care. And there's a special issue. Many thanks to Mike Derringer for dedicating a special issue to this. So it, it's all available to the public for use right now. And we are very much hoping that this will help to build a foundation for the future of coma research. Fantastic, Brian. Um, in, in neurocritical care, uh, you recently published along with uh, a neuroethicist at Mass General Hospital, Michael Young, uh, this really wonderful paper that I wanted to highlight on the, a framework for ethical disclosure of test results. And in that paper, I think this sort of gets to this uh, speaking the same language. You talk about the various methods to assess uh, 
for either covert consciousness or uh, cortical processing or cognitive motor dissociation. And uh, I, I think the, the modality sort of depends on uh, or determines um, perhaps the, the diagnosis. Can you talk a little bit about some of these different modalities and what they, they tell us about consciousness? Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, Nick, to dive into this, because this is an issue that we have debated, that we have struggled with, and I, that I think as a field, we are going to continue to face over the next many years and decades to come as we begin to integrate task-based functional MRI, which can identify evidence of volitional brain activity in patients who appear unresponsive on their bedside exam, evidence, as you refer to, of covert consciousness, also referred to as cognitive motor dissociation, a term coined by Nico Schiff in 2015, the idea that a patient's level of cognition might be higher than their ability for motoric expression. And this phenomenon of covert consciousness can be detected not just with task-based fMRI, also with task-based EEG at the bedside. And I want to highlight Jan Klassen's work and his team at uh, Columbia, who have published se several seminal papers in this field. What we now face is the possibility that these tools can inform our care, but along with that opportunity is the challenge of communicating these complex and incredibly sensitive results to families and surrogates and other loved ones. And uh, you mentioned Michael Young, he's a, a neurologist and neuroethicist at MGH who has really been playing a leadership role uh, in this field along with Joe, Joe Finns, Arian Lewis, uh, the, the, the list goes on and on. There are many neuroethicists who've been focusing on these questions as well. And you know, perhaps I'll share with you a couple of, of, uh, of lessons learned that, that we've experienced. To provide some historical context here, we at MGH, and there's several other groups who are doing this now as well, Verena Boerwinkel, for example, her group at UNC are beginning to perform these types of assessments for clinical purposes. And in that context, of course, we're sharing the results with other clinicians and families and sitting down for, for goals of care meetings and, and looking at the results together. But at Mass General, we've had this experience dating back to 2012, where in our research studies, the Institutional Review Board has given us permission to share the results with families at their discretion. And I'll mention that of the 100 or so patients whom we've studied since 2012, every single family member has requested access to the information. Not a single one has said that they don't want to know the result. Mm. Mm. And so whether it's in that context of sharing potentially clinically relevant research results, or whether it's, whether it's sharing the results of advanced neurotechnological neurotechno tests that were performed for research alone, either way, this is something that we've been you know, trying to improve upon and, and to develop for the last decade or so. And what Michael Young's paper does is to address each of the challenges um, that we as clinicians face with respect to communication. Um, and so I wanna refer, you know, recognizing that our time is limited, I wanna refer your listeners to that paper because it really provides a helpful overview of how we can responsibly communicate uh, these data. But suffice it to say, the data are complex. And even we as, a cl as clinicians and as investigators in this field are still trying to decipher what they mean. What does it take for an fMRI or an EEG test to prove that someone is conscious? Even that is debated. And then once we reach a consensus on those types of questions, how do we explain these complex concepts of different levels of consciousness or covert consciousness to the lay public? Another concern, just to highlight one key issue here is some ethicists who we've collaborated with have made the point that an image, an fMRI scan or an EEG uh, topographic map is so emotionally powerful and salient that is there a risk that some families will overinterpret mm -hmm. the results of these advanced neurotechnologies and place more weight on them than other data like behavioral assessments or kind of standard conventional MRI or EEG? then the advanced techniques deserve. Is there a chance that we can overinterpret them and rely too heavily on them? That is a risk that we're confronting. And finally, and perhaps the most important point that I would make is that these tests, like any other technique we use in the ICU, have fundamental limitations. The most important of which, in my opinion, is a high false negative rate. So if the three of us and one more of your listeners, four people were to have a task-based fMRI or EEG today, there's a 25% chance, a one in four chance that we would have a negative result. So one of the four of us would have a negative result either because we're not paying attention, we're not trying hard enough to do the, the motor imagery task, like imagine opening and closing your hand, or maybe we fell asleep in the scanner, 
Our patients have fluctuating arousal. They might be on sedatives. And there are many, many, many confounders that can call, cause a false negative. And so we always explain to families that a negative result on these advanced neurotechnologies does not predict a poor outcome because of that high false negative rate. A quick final comment I'll make here is that if you look at the work out of the group at Columbia, and there's some other groups who are doing motor action, where a patient gets a command to open and close your hand, as opposed to a, a motor imagery command, like imagine opening and closing your hand, and there appears to be a lower false positive rate with the motor action task, but that's something that's still being navigated and figured out, figured out which are the commands that are going to get us the highest sensitivity moving forward. I'll stop there. Oh, that, that's great, Brian. Maybe maybe you could touch on a little bit. Um, you mentioned these active um, task-based uh, paradigms, but how about some of the, the passive stimulus-based techniques and how, how might they compare to those? Really appreciate the question. And I'm going to try not to dive too far into the weeds here because there's <laughs> almost endless complexity. And this is where you know, the, the, the debates go far beyond uh, neuroscience to ethics and philosophy. There's so much, there's so many interesting um, aspects and angles to this debate. But what I believe the consensus currently is in our field, and I'm speaking here not of my own opinion necessarily, but kind of what I've gleaned from asking many other trusted and wise colleagues in the field at, at national and international conferences, is that most people in our field appear to believe that to prove somebody is conscious or covertly conscious, they have to follow a task, show volitional brain activity during a task-based functional MRI or EEG assessment. And just to be clear about what is being assessed, during those assessments, the patient hears a command, imagine opening and closing your hand, and then there's silence. And then the command is now rest, and then there's more silence. And in the analysis, we are comparing the periods of silence when they were commanded to do the task versus when they were commanded to rest. So there's no stimulus during those periods. And hence any change in brain activity that we observe should be attributable to the patient's volitional brain activity. By contrast, what you mentioned, these stimulus-based paradigms where a, patient's is, a patient is listening to a narrative, maybe it's a story, maybe it's a, uh, something the family saying that was reported that is then being played back to them in the scanner during the EEG. Maybe it's uh, a musical piece that they're listening to. During those types of assessments, we are looking at the patient's passive response to that language or music stimulus. And most people in the field seem to think that the brain's passive response to a stimulus, even if it's within association cortex, like Wernicke's area, does not prove that somebody is conscious. It may represent comprehension and understanding and consciousness, but it may also represent subconscious levels of perception. And, and I would point uh, your listeners to, there's a, a very elegant PNAS paper uh, by David Menon's lab at Cambridge, where they did a study in healthy controls, getting higher levels of propofol, and even when those controls were completely behaviorally unresponsive, went in the scanner on high doses of continuous propofol, they still had responses within association cortices to these language stim. So that was one of several studies suggesting that your cortex can respond to a stimulus even if you are likely unconscious. And I say likely there because we still, as a field, lack a gold standard for consciousness. And, and so maybe I'll, I'll take a moment here while we're thinking about a gold standard, just to talk about TMS EEG. Yeah, please, another please. Te <laughs> another technique that's, I hope it's not- I'm hoping far, you would, I was hoping you would. So, you know, and for a follow-up podcast, I, I would encourage you to, to bring in, you know, Marcello Massimini and uh, and and his team in Milan or um, or Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi, those who have really pioneered this technique because they would have, you know, far more eloquent insights to share on this. But I'll, I'll share with you what I think what they, you know, those who develop the technique and what others who are using it, like our group, um, what we think is so exciting about it. Some of the benefits here, and, and for your listeners who may not be familiar with it, the idea is that you have EEG leads on, and usually it's with a high density 64 channel cap, but it can be done with a standard uh, 1020 electrode setup. And you administer a TMS pulse to the brain, to the surface of the brain, the cortex, and you record the electrophysiologic ripples that emerge from that pulse. And the more complex those ripples are and the longer they last in duration, the more likely that person is to be conscious. That's the idea behind the technique. And the analogy that we use is it's like throwing a pebble in a lake. 
the pebble is the TMS, -E, the TMS pulse. And then when the pebble hits the lake and the waves or the ripples emerge, those are the electrical ripples that you're measuring with EEG. And the complexity of those ripples can be measured using the PCI, the Perturbational Complexity Index, an index from zero to one, where one is the most complex and zero is no complexity. And some really beautiful work that's been done by Dr. Massimini's lab over the last decade or so has shown that there is a, an apparent threshold, 0.31, above which somebody is likely to be conscious if their PCI is above that level. And the really exciting thing about TMS EEG, even though it has not been tested in the ICU to the degree that task-based fMRI and task-based EEG have to date, is that it does not require any participation. The patient is just is basically hanging out, doing nothing, not being asked to do anything. And so if you think of our patients with severe TBI, for example, who might have bifrontal contusions or injury to their basal forebrain, where even if they're conscious, they might not have the attentional uh, reservoir or, or reserves to focus on a task, or they might not have the higher level cognition to perform a task over and over again, even if they're conscious. These are the types of patients that TMS EEG might be able to detect consciousness in where it would be missed with the other modalities. It also completely bypasses the sensory system. So let's say you have a TBI patient who has ruptured tympanic membranes and has injury or, or brainstem or thalamic injury that, that disrupts some of the hearing pathways. They might not be able to even hear the stimulus you're giving them with task-based fMRI or EEG, but that doesn't matter for TMS EEG because it bypasses those systems. There's no requirement for motoric output. It doesn't matter if that patient has cortical spinal tract injury in their brainstem or their cord because you're measuring complexity simply by stimulating the surface of the brain without any reliance on sensory input or motoric outputs. So these are some of the methodologic benefits that have led to a lot of excitement behind TMS EEG. And if you look at its performance characteristics, so in healthy controls like us, 25% of us are gonna test negative on task-based fMRI or EEG with motor imagery, yet the work out of Massimini's lab suggests that 100%, and you know, nothing in science is ever 100%, but yeah. if you look at their data, 100% of the healthy controls have shown PCI above 0.31. And then if you look at a variety of other conditions, healthy volunteers who are receiving different levels of sedation on and off, people who are in uh, states with ketamine or other types of psychotropic meds, and then patients, probably the most important statistic I'll share, patients with severe brain injuries who have just recovered the ability to follow commands on the bedside behavioral exam. If you look at uh, Sylvia Casarado, Mario Ra Ra uh, Rosanova's work, 94.7% of them, so basically 95% have a PCI greater than 0.31. Whereas if you look at that group with task-based fMRI or EEG, the false negative rates approach, approach 50 to 60%. So the performance characteristics of TMS EEG to date appear to be greater than those of task-based fMRI or EEG, but I want to acknowledge that it hasn't been tested as rigorously in the ICU. And then there's the philosophical uh, debate. If somebody's PCI is greater than 0.31, does it prove that they're conscious? Uh, for that, I, I would ask that you invite the experts to debate that because I, I, you know, I'd be much more curious to hear their thoughts on that question. No, I think thanks for that wonderful description of TMS EEG. We've we've talked about some of the these high tech solutions that have, have been going forward, but in the literature, I think there've been some really fascinating work on sort of our our normal bedside exam and uh, or, or perhaps not our normal bedside exam, improved bedside exams, and how we might be able to do a better job of detecting consciousness in the ICU. I know you were part of a group that worked on uh, this this fast version of the coma recovery the coma recovery scale revised, um, where in as little as is it six and a half minutes we we might have uh, a better assessment of consciousness. Can you talk a little bit about that work and how you're implementing that work into your ICU practice? Absolutely. So, and I appreciate you brought up the behavioral exam because, again, if you look at the ethics studies, the questionnaires. Um, and I mentioned some of Michael Young's work. I also want to hi uh, highlight to your, your readership the work of Andrew Peterson, who's done some really groundbreaking studies interviewing families to ask for their preferences. As mentioned earlier, every family, you know, when you look at these studies, is interested in the advanced tests. But to your point, the behavioral exam is and probably will always be the foundational component of the assessment of consciousness. And, you know, I would argue that if there is a single test or tool 
that we have to focus on if in a resource limited setting, for example, the behavioral exam is always going to be pre a really comprehensive behavioral exam is always going to be more useful to us as clinicians, um, especially when we sit down to try to provide guidance to families than these fancier advanced neurotechnological tests. So appreciate the opportunity to kind of refocus us on behavior. And you know, the, the we're all familiar with the Coma Recovery Scale Revised developed by Giacino, Kalmar, and colleagues, and how that has essentially revolutionized our field and certainly is the standard behavioral assessment in the subacute and the chronic setting. It's been translated to over a dozen languages, endorsed by ACRM, et cetera. But for those of us who are ICU clinicians, we've seen, or in our experience, having 30 to 45 minutes for a comprehensive behavioral exam is not always an option. You know, you th we, we can all think of those patients who become bronchospastic or unstable or elevated ICP or the long list of things that can happen when you hold sedation for more than a few minutes, sometimes just for more than a few seconds. And so feasibility becomes a critically important issue with respect to the CRSR and whether it can be implemented in the ICU. Now, to be fair, there are some studies that have shown the CRSR can be done. Uh, Arian Lewis's group uh, at NYU did, did some really uh, elegant work with the, the CRSR during the COVID pandemic, showing that it was possible in that patient population with disorders of consciousness. So I don't want to give the impression that it can't be done, but it's certainly challenging. And with that challenge in mind, the uh, the CRSR FAST evaluation that you alluded to, and really I want to give credit here, uh, Yelena Bodine, Joe Giacino, who, who led this study, uh, I want to make sure they get the credit for this. Um, the paper just came out in Annals of Neurology last year. And what it showed was that the CRSR FAST, which was an abbreviated version of the CRSR, it was designed to assess the key elements of behavior that are most important to detecting consciousness on the CRSR, to select those out, perform them as quickly as possible, and make it feasible to do in the ICU within about five minutes. And the bottom line is the average time for CRSR FAST in that study I want to say it was about six minutes or so. So it got very close to that five minute goal and the sensitivity and specificity against the gold standard CRSR was quite high. And I can't remember the exact statistics off my head right now, but if you look at the paper, the performance characteristics were not just satisfactory. They were quite encouraging that, the, that, that this behavioral assessment, the CRSR FAST may, and it's going to require validation. And we want to be humble here that there's more work to do. But this is a very exciting opportunity for us to improve the quality of our behavioral assessments and to do so in a rapid manner that is feasible in our ICUs. Yeah, I think this is huge for us that spend most of our, our waking hours in, in the intensive care unit and to be able to bring that careful bedside assessment that was done in uh, rehab and at skilled nursing facilities, uh, LTAX, and bring it into the ICU I think is really powerful in such a way that it's quick enough, we can actually do it serially. And, and even within a day, we can do multiple exams. Um, that's gonna be a really powerful tool moving forward. Um, we're we're coming up on, on time here and I just uh, wanted to make sure we took some time to, to look a little bit into the future. And so I know uh, as part of your work, Brian, you've been looking at these uh, gap analyses and uh, there was a, a recent analysis on brain computer interfaces uh, that I saw that you were part of. Um, tell us, as you look into 2024 into uh, 2025, um, what are some of these key gaps that are being addressed, and you know how close are we to making some uh, really pivotal breakthroughs? Perhaps, um, maybe if not on the assessment side that we've been talking about, uh, maybe the management side that uh, Claude brought up in the beginning of this. Thanks, Nick. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to look to the future and think of how we can be doing better for our patients and their families moving forward. And again, really want to credit here. Claude, Daiwai, other members of leadership, um, Robert Stevens and Mike Derringer, who led these coma science groups and, uh, that form these uh, teams for gap analyses. And you know, I'll just say, as, as somebody who's participated in these efforts, it's been an incredible learning experience, really interesting, also a lot of fun to get to meet uh, people around the world who, who are passionate about um, disorders of consciousness and helping this patient population. And I mean, there's so many you know specific recommendations you referred to uh, the brain computer interface gap analysis that was led by Nico Schiff. Um, there was recently a, um, a covert consciousness gap analysis led by Jan Klassen and colleagues. And so there are many, many recommendations in each of those manuscripts and the other gap analyses that are now coming out. And, and I would refer your readership to those papers for all of the details. Certainly there are 
th there's progress that we can make with respect to hardware, software, all of the technological breakthroughs that are going to be necessary to create the next generation of BCIs or better paradigms for task-based fMRI and EEG. And a lot of those details get you know quite nuanced and maybe are not worthy of our time right now. I think the bigger principle that those papers highlight and that I would emphasize is international collaboration. And you know, it might sound kind of cliched or cheesy and, and kind of like a catchphrase, but you know, if you look at the history of our field and the the, the big groundbreaking milestone studies, the, the Adrian Owen Science 2006 paper, the first covert consciousness assessment with task-based fMRI, uh, you know, a single patient. And then if you look at, you know, the, the Martin Monty New England Journal 20, um, I'm blanking on the year right now, I think it was 2012 uh, or 2010, that the, the big follow-up paper that came out, 54 patients. And, and that was huge at the time just to have a, a, a few dozen patients uh, studied. And it's been, our, our field has been a story of very small case reports and case series with a few notable exceptions. The Liège group led by Stephen Laureus has published some larger cohorts, but most of the studies have been small. And I think everybody has realized that we have taken this as far as we can take it with small cohort studies. We need larger studies that will require international collaboration for us to reach the levels of evidence that will be needed for to change clinical practice, to get FDA approval for some of these interventions, whether they're diagnostic, prognostic, or ideally therapeutic, which as you and Claude mentioned earlier, is really what we all hope for. And so I think that's the message that I would want to leave your listeners with is just committing ourselves as a community to working together, not just multi-site, but truly internationally, because that is the only way that we're going to get large enough sample sizes to, to move the field forward. Claude, well, I know one of the goals of the Curing Coma campaign really is to help build that infrastructure for multi-center prospective studies. Um, where, where are we with that? <laughs> you know, I'm so glad you uh, brought this up. I just returned from the ONIM, uh, German Neurocritical Care Society meeting, where we had a joint meeting between NCS and the DGNI and had a, had a good NCS contingent present and was part of a coma recovery uh, session. Uh, talking with Daniel Conziella, who uh, is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and, and ran the uh, European uh, Academy of Neurology Disorders of Consciousness Guidelines, Raymond Helbach from Linz, Austria, that you mentioned, and um, Andreas Bender uh, uh, from Germany, who's working in the post-acute stage. And you're absolutely right. This resonates uh, across pretty much anybody that takes care of these patients uh, worldwide in a variety of different um, uh, economic settings and scientific settings and clinical settings. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing through the, the Curing Coma campaign, uh, we have a group called Prospective Studies, which is focused on what are the next studies that we need to do as a, as a NCS and as a Curing Coma campaign in order to lay the found work, uh, foundation and groundwork for um, uh, for getting to the point where we're testing treatments. And then we have a member sites group, which is uh, started by bringing together the, the Compose investigators. But we have about 50 uh, plus sites that are at the ready uh, for, uh, for these next prospective studies. And these range from uh, high income to low and middle income countries. And so, and there's a lot of interest in LMIC groups for uh, ways that they can take this information uh, within the cons construct of their available resources and, and push this forward. So a lot of optimism, a lot of positivity, uh, and uh, I think we're, we're building the network. That's, that's great. And I think so important that one of my biggest fears in all of this is that we further inequities in what, in what we do uh, between sort of the haves and have nots. And um, I, I think through the Curing Coma campaign, if we can address that early and make sure that we're thinking about these issues of, of feasibility and cost as we further the science, it, it's going to be so important to to having these technological and, and scientific breakthroughs uh, improve the care of all patients and not just the ones that are lucky enough to go to Mass General Hospital or UCSF or University of Maryland. Um, um, I, I agree com completely, and, and that brings it full circle to what we were 
talking about at the beginning of the podcast, which is World Coma Day. I mean, that's why yeah. that's why we've got World Coma Day because we recognize that this is uh, a, a common shared uh, uh, problem and issue, and and one that we want to tackle together. Well. I think that wraps it up nicely. So um, for those who are interested, if you want to find out more about World Coma Day or the Curing Coma Campaign, you can go to curingcoma.org. World Coma Day is on March 22nd. Uh, there will be a, a Netflix-like binge <laughs> of <laughs> World Coma Day content um, and, and hopefully a bunch of World Coma Day influencers that will be spreading that content. So we're really excited for it. Um, thanks so much to uh, Claude Hemphill and Brian Edlow for coming on the podcast. Uh, we really, really appreciate your insights into this emerging science, and uh, we can't wait to see what's going to happen in the next year. Um, I'm Nick Morris for the Neurocritical Care Society podcast, and we will catch you next time. Uh, the podcast is available anywhere you get your podcasts, and uh, there are CME credits available for select episodes. Thanks for joining us.